All right. Now, um, to introduce you to the person who's going to introduce today's speaker, the introducer is Carl Kurtz. Come on up, Carl. Good afternoon. <clears throat> David Farnan is the director of the Boulder Public Library. He became director eight years ago and has overseen the renovation of the main library and the opening of North Boulder Library. He helped lead, lead Boulder Public Library to the Colorado Library of the Year Award in 2017. He has been in public library leadership positions in Colorado, Ohio, and Florida for the past two and a half decades. Now there are two statistics about the Boulder Library that amaze me. One is that the libraries receive more than one million visits per year. That's nearly 10 visits per capita, the highest of any city or metro area library. The second is that there are 126,000 library card holders. That amounts to 118% of Boulder's population. <laughs> and maybe David will explain that to us. So John mentioned that um, David, as a city employee, cannot take a position on policy issues. And in that way, he's just like the Boulder Rotary Club. We don't take positions on public policy issues. And as you all know, we have a pending controversial proposal to create a new library district in Boulder. And in the question period that follows, we hope that you will honor that rule of our club and focus on questions rather than advocacy one way or another. So welcome, David. We look forward to your remarks. Thank you very much, and thank you all for having me. I'm going to set a little timer here because I, I have heard that you guys have really great questions, and I love nothing more than really great questions. So I can talk about libraries. Um, for all day. So I, I, I could keep you here past 6 p.m. talking about libraries. I am, I've been it, I, I count myself as being very fortunate to have uh, found this career. Uh, I found my, count myself very fortunate to have arrived in Boulder uh, uh, over eight years ago to um, take this job. It's been, a, it's been an honor and a privilege. So um, I was asked today to speak just a little bit about um, libraries in general and then touch on some of the history of how we arrived at this discussion around the library district and talk then a little also about the future of libraries. And I can assure you, I believe the future of libraries is a bright one um, in whatever respect we can do it. So um, I'm gonna start off with just uh, something that I'm sure you've all kind of thought about it, but uh, maybe in a little bit of a different way, is that libraries, uh, in my mind, the public libraries in this country have never been about books. Um, we've always been about reading and literacy and about uh, creating a, a free and open community gathering place for the community to come together, to share knowledge, to collaborate together. That is, in essence, what the public library is about. It's the community coming together in a gathering place to share knowledge. And how public, Boulder Public Library has exemplified that, I mean, we have gone through a massive transformation really over the last eight years, beginning with the renovation of the main library, but it's a trajectory that we've been on for a long time. Um, Many of you may be familiar with the public library movement in the United States. It, it, I mean, it's said that it began 250 years ago, but it really began in earnest in the 1890s. And the director of the public library of Denver at the time, John Cotton Dana, um, not widely known, but in library circles, he is credited with being the, basically the inventor of the modern public library. He created the first children's room. He opened the stacks to the public. Uh, he he promoted the idea of literacy and reading for everyone. And libraries are free and open access to everyone, and I think lots of people are familiar with that language. Uh, perhaps what they're less familiar with um, is that libraries, uh, our primary ethic is in defense of the First Amendment. 
I loved when your, your, your opening statement of your principles of, is it the truth? Uh, that's a very important question in terms of libraries because my ethics as a librarian insists that I not only provide equitable, equitable access to information, but that we provide accurate information. So I'm a stickler in terms of like, what is the truth? That, that is, is this the truth? And I, that's always a very difficult thing. And certainly in our current society and environment, um, that has been politicized in many ways. There, there are people who question what the truth actually is. I don't want to go into that. Politics, like libraries are my favorite thing to talk about. Politics is my least favorite thing to talk about. Um, but libraries have, you know, spent their entire modern history um, fighting against any form of censorship. Uh, we refuse in some ways as best we can and try to work with the community to understand that there may be people with different viewpoints than you in, in your community, and so we need to be able to uh, show all sides of information. So Boulder Public Library has been on a nice winning streak, and I, I'm, I am uh, humbled by the fact that we won Library of the Year. That is uh, a remarkable achievement in the state of Colorado. That's of all types of libraries uh, to win Library of the Year. And it kind of goes really to, it's a testament to, um, in some ways, all the numbers, right? All the data. So people ask me like all the time, like, how do you do a million visitors a year? And it's like, I wish I knew the easy answer to that. I mean, the easiest answer that I can give to that is this community. It, it, it's less about the library than it is about the relationship between the library and the community. And this community is a highly educated one. It's, if you look at a recipe for library soup, what makes a really good library, you're looking for a very educated community. Um, and Boulder exemplifies that. And so they love their library. And that's been a real boon for us and really driven um, the ability for us to innovate in ways that other libraries maybe are not able to do so. We've introduced a whole bunch of new things, opening the new North Boulder Library. Um, happened kind of on a shoestring. It was one of these things where Boulder Housing Partners was opening a site. They had a little corner store. They asked um, the residents of the Boulder Housing Partners site, what would you like in a corner store? I mean, I think they thought they were going to ask for an ice cream shop or something, but they said they wanted a library. And so they came to the city and said, we want a library. And so we decided like, okay, how can we do this quickly? Uh, it's 576 square feet. I'm sure you could fit 10 of them in this room or maybe more in this room. Uh, in the first year, it has no parking. In the first year it opened, it had nearly 50,000 visitors. That speaks to a, a kind of a pent up demand for library services and really what libraries mean. So going back to John Cotton Dana, John Cotton Dana said, um, and it's curious that it made me think quite a lot. And he said, um, the public library is foremost about happiness. Um, second of all, it's about education. But what did he mean by, in 1896, what did he mean by the fact that the public library was foremost about happiness? And I really think it's about that sense, right? That sense that a community wants a library, you provide this free and open public space which allows people to come in and share and talk about information um, and, and share ideas and collaborate together. That's what creates a good community. We all believe that reading, I think we all believe, that reading is a good thing. Reading begets reading. The more reading you do, the better, the better off you are. And having an educated public is one that creates a great community. That's really the goal of a public library. So now to venture on into, uh, spent my five minutes on libraries, I'm happy to talk about individual services. I'm asked all the time, can you put all the stuff that the library does on one page? And I'm like, no, uh, the library, the public library really is what you imagine it to be. Um, we are there, we, we believe truly that we are collaborators. I mean, we have done, there have been so many remarkable achievements of public libraries over that 100, 200 year history. Um, most recently in Boulder Public Library, our numbers have been extraordinarily high around early literacy programs, uh, story time for children and caregivers. Um, Building 61 is, is an anomaly in public libraries, but one that I had tried in two other communities, successfully tried in two communities prior to Boulder, but the success that we've had in Boulder has been extraordinary. We opened up Building 61. It's a high-tech makerspace uh, in 2015. Uh, since that time, I believe it's now close to 150 small businesses have launched from the space. There have been 12, there are 12 patents pending out of that space. Uh, it is, that is again a sign, not necessarily what the library did, but of that relationship between a library and its community. The, the level of innovation and the level of um, 
entrepreneurship and thoughtfulness that, that occurs in Boulder is unlike most communities uh, throughout this country. Um, so how do we get to this big discussion about the library district, which I know is what you guys really want to talk about. So um, this is a long discussion as well, right? So I have notes in my office going back to 1987 from meetings occurring between all the municipalities and the county and all these different groups around this very same topic. So the conversation has been going on at least in Boulder for, for the past 35 years. Um, most recently it came, uh, uh, came to the fore in the context of the library master plan. So city departments, of which uh, the library is one, create a master plan every decade. That master plan is intended to define what the community wants to see from that city department. And you go into deep dive with the community. I think uh, when we did our master plan, it was the largest uh, public participation that the city had ever had. We had over 3,300 people participate in the master plan in focus groups and in surveys and in polls and in one-on-one -on -one conversations and all these different things. And they came back with a lot of different things that they wanted uh, for their library. Um, I would say the one unique thing that we set out to do um, was to say, how are we going to pay for this? Um, so typically, the city departments present a master plan. There's a lot of different things in there. People say, oh, wow, this is a lot of stuff. It's going to cost a lot of money. But nobody tries to spend the time saying how we're going to pay for it. And so from the moment I got here in 2013, um, my task, my work plan was, you know, try to identify alternative forms of funding for the public library. That was in my work plan. I said, can I have a two-year moratorium while I try to figure out what this library is doing, first of all? And they said, sure, you can have a two-year moratorium, but then we want you to dig in and start figuring out what are alternative forms of funding. So we did quite a lot of research in the context of that master plan to identify how we could fund the programs that the community was asking for. And the community really wasn't asking for much. I mean, they were asking for a new North Boulder library. Um, which we are currently uh, in the process of executing on. They wanted a library and gun barrel. They wanted to activate the Canyon Theater. They wanted more programs for youth. They wanted more programs for underserved youth, so uh, non-English speaking populations. The library does all of those things, but most of those programs are grant funded. And not, I wouldn't say, they, you know, the Library Foundation has been extraordinarily generous with the library, but they're not sustainable in the sense of which we can scale them up. You, you develop a program, you can hit 150 kids um, who, who are non-native English speakers, but in order to make that program available to everyone, you need to have a robust uh, source of income or revenue in order to be able to generate that program. So the master plan came forward with, the master plan proposes a number of different ideas for how to fund um, the library and execution of that master plan. Um, what the library commission, so if you're familiar with city government, city council appoints commissioners who make decisions with regard, and so we take all of our work to the library commission as well as taking it to the city council. The library commission at that time unanimously, and this was in 2018, early 2018, unanimously endorsed the idea of a library district. And they endorsed that idea uh, in their words as the most fair and equitable form of funding, a sustainable, sustainably funding the public library for the future. So that was a critical kind of component of the presentation. Um, we began talking about council with council about that in early 2018. Um, council was non-committal, obviously at that time, uh, in terms of moving forward with this. Um, but now, at the uh, what four years later, I, I asked my admin just a few weeks ago, how many times have I been to city council to discuss this topic since 2018? Um, it's been 15 times. Um, April 5th will be the 16th time that I'm in front of city council to discuss the idea of uh, the library district. It's not solely the library district that we're talking about, but really talking about how we sustainably fund the public library. Um, last year, well, in 2020, we were scheduled to, to go forward. The council at that time had asked us to begin to build a work plan for what it would look like to form a library district in May of 2021. They unanimously approved of the idea of moving forward with a work plan to form a library district by resolution. Um, this last month, we had a council meeting uh, to go over the recommendations of another committee, which was the Library District Advisory Committee, which council appointed last October to make recommendations as well. So we discussed what their recommendations were. But on April 5th, uh, I will be back to city council for the 16th time 
and we will be discussing at that time whether or not to form a library district um, by resolution. Um, doing it by resolution only really creates um, a paper uh, district. Um, some things begin in motion at that time, but the primary thing that begins in motion at that time is um, they have to go, the, the library district itself, which would be a separate governmental entity, would have to then prepare for a Tabor election so that all the people within the district have an opportunity to vote as to whether or not they want to be taxed to fund this independent government entity. If they choose not to be taxed for, that, for funding a government entity, they will have another opportunity to run an election before 2024 is how council has described it. Um, if it fails to get funding by 2024, then the district would, would essentially dissolve. It would no longer be a district even on paper. It would be just a city funded library. So um, one of the things, that's pretty much in a nutshell my history of uh, the district thing and I'm happy to answer questions that you may have. There's been a lot of information um, out there. I think there have been some levels of misunderstanding and you know, is it the truth? Um, I, I think I can dispel some of them, right? So there has been some talk about this is a 90% increase in, ta in funding for the library. That's not true. I mean, the, the manner in which we've presented to council has been consistent. I mean, there's two different things, right? So there's the budget, which the city manager puts to get assembles, assembles and council approves. That shows $1 amount, but then the legitimate number and the legitimate number that most people in the community want to know is, how much taxpayer money goes to funding the library. And so that number we have consistently presented to council is roughly around $14 million a year. That's the cost not only of operating the library, but it's the cost of HR, it's the cost of maintaining the facilities, it's the cost of you know, hiring people, it's the cost of all the IT infrastructure. None of those show up in the $10 million budget, which is the number which people are using to say, like, it's a 90% increase. Um, the real amount of taxpayer money that's currently going into funding the library is right around $14 million. It'll go up to $15 million once the new North Boulder Library opens. Um, if we were to uh, address the facilities backlog, which we currently have, um, it would go up to probably around $16.5 million. Um, the, the city does not currently have a plan for addressing. We, we want to. We want to figure out a way to address the facilities backlog, but there's not a plan uh, uh, or a funding source at this point that we've identified to address all those backlog issues. So the cost is one that's fluid um, to some extent, but certainly well above $14 million. One of the other items that's gone around um, has been this notion of it's a self-perpetuating um, board of trustees, which is also just not true. So the, the way the law is written, Colorado law is very specific, um, the, the responsibility for appointing of trustees resides with the establishing governmental entities and those are the City Council of Boulder and the Board of County Commissioners of Boulder County. They have to appoint the Board of Trustees who would then run the library district. Um, their negligence to do so um, I, I, don't, I don't even think that's really a question. I mean, I think some people have thrown out like, what if they just don't do it? Um, if they don't do it, then I don't know what happens. But it, as the way the law is written, they, there's only two options, and that is, and both of those options uh, include county, city council and the board of county commissioners appointing those groups. So I'm gonna close a little bit with the future of public libraries, and I think the future is bright, really bright. Um, the, um, a, a, a gentleman I know and, and respect and admire, I was a fan of his years and years and years ago as, a, as an extreme runner in Boulder, wrote a thing recently and he said like, who uses the public library? And I wrote back to him and I was like, his name, and I was like, look at this data, right? Like these are the people that use the public library. Um, you know, 40 to 45% of the people who walk through our door on a daily basis are children and families. Uh, that number that's a million is a shocking number. It's, it's significantly higher than any other community in the state of Colorado. Nobody, nobody sees that kind of number, but it's driven primarily by children and families. And then the other large group, which national studies repeatedly show is the highest users of, of public libraries are millennials. Now, you can think all you want about millennials and how they've, we've lost them all to video games. Uh, they are the second largest user group of public libraries. Uh, that we have right now, teenagers and up to the 30-year-olds. 30 30 year they are heavy users of public libraries. They don't ask for much. They come in and they use it as they want, but they are, they are the highest percentage of users that we have after children and families. Um, 
that speaks well of the future of public libraries. Um, people love books, reading. Um, I was around when, uh, you know, the whole bricks and clicks debate kind of came up. I remember, I remember the moment that um, a staff member came into my office in like 1996 and asked me, showed me this search engine called Google, and they said like, have you seen this? And I was like, no, it's amazing. And they were like, should we tell the customers? And I'm like, by all means, by all means, we have to tell the customers. Uh, this changes in some ways what libraries do. But libraries were never, um, you know, as much as they may have presented themselves that way in the 60s, they were never like the key cog in the, in the information economy. That was never the objective. The objective was to provide information to people who actually, public libraries at least, they were, they were, their objective was to provide this community gathering place and really a place where all people from the community could come together and share and participate in shared resources. So um, I'm optimistic about public libraries. Um, this last year, uh, the pandemic hit us really, really hard in the last two years, as it did everyone. Um, we closed buildings, we laid off lots of staff members. Um, but last summer, our summer reading program had the highest participation we've ever had uh, in the entire history of Boulder Public Library. Over 4,000 kids read over 2 million minutes. Um, it was a phenomenal uh, program. Uh, I, the staff came to me and said, what if we do 500,000 minutes? And I was like, that's not enough. And they were saying, what do you do if, if, we, if we double it? And I was like, I'll dye my beard or shave my head. And so they said, okay, if you dye your beard rainbow, we'll hit a million minutes. And I was like, okay, I'll do it. And so they hit a million minutes, I dived my beard rainbow, and then before we were done, it was well over two million minutes of, of children's reading. And then I think a lot of the people have this question about, what, app, what about online? Well, the library is online. I mean, little do people know that over, well over 30% of all of our circulation last year came from eBooks. Uh, we are a distributor of eBooks. A lot of our patrons don't come walking through the door, although a million of them do. Many of them use us online and they can check out books and download them to their e-readers and, and go about their business that way. So um, I'm very optimistic about public libraries. I'm, I know it's gonna succeed in the future. It's been around for 150 years. People are frequently predicting its demise. Uh, all I ever see is the numbers keep going up and up and up and up and up. So I'm happy to take your questions. As was mentioned before, I will not engage in any kind of political uh, stuff, but if you have political questions, I'll do my best to, to give you uh, what is truthful. Thank you very much. Yes, sir. In the 1930s and beyond, uh, various now famous novels couldn't be read in public schools and when they were in libraries had to be kept in a special locked section. So my question is this, we read in the paper about school boards preventing you know, children from having access to real American history like the 1619 Project and what have you. My question is, are there any limitations in the Boulder Library on any pressures uh, for uh, what you should acquire or not acquire? And I assume not in Boulder, but how about elsewhere in Colorado? Yeah, elsewhere in Colorado, yes. Um, so Weld County has been having a controversy about that currently, right? So, I mean, the, the question, the, the issues surrounding what we should and should not read persist, right, in our yeah. country, and they are prevalent today. Um, I'm happy to say in Boulder, um, we have a process for a formal challenge. Um, you can formally challenge a book if you would like to. Um, in my time here in Boulder, we've had one. So in eight years, we've had one formal challenge. What we typically do is somebody will say, I don't think this book belongs either in this section for kids or for adults or I don't believe it belongs in the library. And then what we do is we typically have one or two staff members read that book, um, and then they are tasked with writing a short review and a summary of both the patron's uh, criticisms and their take also. So a couple of librarians would then give that to me. I review it and we discuss as a team um, what we should do in response. Um, 
the book, and you know, I don't, I don't intend to, you know, mischaracter. Almost all of those challenges are well-intentioned to people. I don't. They, they do not. They do not start. It's very rarely the my, in my experience. It's very rarely the case that a member of the public comes forward and says, like, I want stuff censored, right? Like. I've experienced that in my career in other communities where people will come, one person comes in with a stack of stuff and they was like, we don't believe this belongs in your library. And I'm like, we? Like, who, are you, who is this you're talking about? And that's typically a, a concerted effort to try to ban certain books. That's not what we see in Boulder and that's not what we see in most communities. So I don't want to characterize the media, love the media, but um, Perhaps some of this is being blown out of proportion. Uh, in, in the context of Boulder, it's typically one well-intentioned person who thinks like, gosh, this doesn't seem appropriate. Um, and we see it on all sides. Uh, you know, there was a 19th century, I don't, I don't know other, how else to characterize it other than a bodice ripper, right? Like, you know, in, in the collection, it was a digital book. It was part of the Duke classics. Um, someone challenged that book as being pornographic. You know, pornographic is a very um, specific definition by the Supreme Court, and it didn't meet that criterion, but yeah, the staff who read it said like, whoa, this is pretty trashy and, and, and bad, but, but we had no intention of removing it from the collection. Um, we spoke to that person, asked them really if they were sincerely interested in censoring it so that no one in the community or that maybe no one in the community would ever have an interest in reading this book, and that was not their interest. Um, we've had similar experiences with a couple of different books um, over the last three or four years. Um, one about a book that negatively, um, it's always hard issues, right? So negatively depicted um, transgender youth. Um, and the book had a very negative depiction of, of those uh, individuals. And there were some people in the community who felt like this is bad. I don't, I don't like it. I mean, and we read the book. It had good reviews from the New York Times, from the Library Journal. Um, it was a, um, yes, it was a, an offensive book in some ways to some people, but it was also a book that people were interested in reading. We had a waiting list of like 15 people for the book. And so when we talked to the groups that were interested in seeing it removed from the collection, that was not their interest. They, they really just wanted to register their, their, their discontent with the fact that this was a book that was in the library. Um, and having done so, they were, they were heard. Um, but yeah, at, the way my librarians think, um, it's really, they, 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 they acknowledge and are, in fact, are proud of the fact that we have something on the shelves to basically offend everybody. There, there, are, there are books, you know, there are, horr there are horrifying books in the library. There, and, I, and I'll be the first to admit it, but I'm not, I'm not going to take them out of the collection merely because they offend the... Because what offends your sensibilities may be different than what offends mine. Um, and, that, and acknowledging that, that we all have different tastes and different interests in reading. The library is meant to be ecumenical with regard to what the public reads and for people to make their own, draw their own conclusions and make intelligent decisions about those. Yes, sir. Uh, thanks for coming to speak with us today. Thank you for uh, having me. I, I have a highly controversial question for you, but <laughs> one that you can hopefully answer. Um, in the last couple of years, can you tell us a few of the books that you've really enjoyed reading? Ah. <laughs> oh. Gosh, I read a lot, um, and I'm, an, I'm not embarrassed. <laughs> I'm not embarrassed to say that um, I, during the pandemic, I went on a serious um, sci-fi jag. So, um, yeah. <laughs> so I, I'm a, I, I am a big science fiction fan. Obviously, a lot of the classics, but then. There are a number of new authors, and I'm just drawing a blank right now, I didn't anticipate this question, um, that I read heavily. And it was funny, I was waiting in line at Chautauqua um, for my kid to get into camp and had the book under my arm and like four people in line had read it and we got into a long discussion about um, a sci-fi book. So yeah, I've spent the pandemic reading um, quite a lot of science fiction. I also try to make it a point to read all of the Nobel Prize winners. Um, um, and I know that, uh, one who I found, I'd never heard of him before until he won the Nobel Prize was uh, Patrick Modiano. Uh, writes very quiet, quiet fiction, um, but mostly around places in France. Um, and so I spent a lot of time reading him during the pandemic as well. 
Thank you for that question. I wish I would have been, I should have brought a list because it's like, I, I do read a lot. Thank you very much for being here. Um, I went back to 1950 when I was hearing you talking about libraries and the Denver Public Library about saved my life. Uh, we had just gotten married, had no money, pregnant, no place to live really. And, but we found a little um, basement apartment when there was almost no place available. But it needed something desperately. So I went to the public library and they checked out to me two beautiful paintings. Mm -hmm. And it just changed how I felt. <laughs> and it meant so much to me. My question, do we still do that? The Boulder Public Library does not check. I mean, I, I don't believe we do. Um, that, that was, you know, that was prevalent up until the 80s and 90s. So the things that we see demand for today, and, and thank you for that. I mean, I, I, public libraries circulate everything, right? Like that, that it, you can find libraries in this country that circulate okay. like um, uh, dress patterns. Like you can, you can go and find a pattern for cutting, or, or pants, like the Cleveland Public Library uh, where I was, they circulated cooking pans. You could get a, you know, a souffle dish. Um, the Boulder Public Library doesn't. One of the things that we have been, um, th again, thanks to the Library Foundation, that's been a hot item uh, really for us through the pandemic is the wireless hotspots. So when the pandemic landed, there was a shortage of access. I mean, Boulder's a very wired community. We know for a fact that 91% of the households have high-speed internet access. 9% um, don't. We know where mostly those 9% are. Um, we had a pilot program in the works at the time the pandemic shut us down to um, attempt to provide wireless access to some of those households. And when I explained to the foundation, like that was my largest disappointment in when the pandemic landed, it's like, oh my gosh, we can't do this pilot program. And they're like, let's do it anyway, let's do it big. And so the foundation actually funded um, over 400 wireless hotspot devices, which we distributed to mostly to folks in the mobile home community in North Boulder, but throughout the, it initially started with um, families with children who needed to have access to wireless for school and that kind of thing when the schools closed down as a result of the pandemic, but then extended that program to seniors uh, and worked with Boulder housing partners and provided wireless hotspots and actually handheld devices and iPads for seniors to be able to have free access to the internet. And the Library Foundation, uh, we, that was a great pilot for us. We learned a lot. We're still circulating those items now as the pandemic closes and we intended to do so for, for as long as we can. Um, the foundation pays for the full coverage of the, the, the data plan as well. So it's free unlimited access to the internet for anyone who comes into the library and checks out that device. Um, we, do, we do circulate some tools and a, a lot of different equipment, but mostly around technology and things that people need in their homes. Maybe we'll bring back paintings, though. I think we still probably have some in the basement. <laughs> Thanks for being here. Uh, I've got an economic question I've always been curious about. With e-books, I, I, you know, I know with a hard-covered book, you go out and you spend the $30 and people can borrow. But what happens, how, do, how does the economics of an e-book work for you? Boy, I could talk for days about this. Um, <laughs> Yeah, so most of you all probably remember 2011, 2012, when, um, when the Kindle came out, right? So ebooks have been around forever. I, I was, I'm proud of the fact that I was the first, I was in Cleveland Heights at the time, and I think it was one of the first public libraries in the country to circulate ebooks. I thought there could be a potential growth, and then it turned up being a penny stock. Nobody wanted them. They, they had more prevalence in the university market for textbooks and that kind of thing, but in public libraries and popular reading, they just never took off. And then the Kindle happened in 2011. It was like, oh my gosh. Um, because at that point, most of the publishers would not sell to us. Um, and Amazon certainly will not sell to public libraries because they restrict the number of devices that an item that they sell can go to, to at that time it was five. And so I spent two years on the circuit arguing with publishers and um, trying to come up with a reasonable model for public libraries to be able to circulate ebooks. 
they eventually settled on a model which is, you know, fair or unfair. It's the model that they came up with. And it's essentially we rent them. So we, we buy the ebook. We pay probably about four or five times the amount that you can buy. You could buy the same ebook online from Amazon for 20 bucks. It cost me 80. Um, wow. And then for that 80, I, I get it for basically 26 circs. And then once 26 circulations have gone, I have to buy it again. So, but if it only, the reason why that's unfair to libraries, in my opinion, and I didn't like it at the time, but I'll take it because it's the best deal I could get, was that if it only circulates once, I still pay 80 bucks. So essentially, libraries uh, assume all of the risk. Um, what happened with ebooks is that, you know, libraries are well, we're well aware of the market for publishing, right? So public libraries make up a little over 10% of all the books that are sold in the United States are sold to public libraries. We're, we're a major market force, and hence why we, we spent so much time sitting down with publishers. Um, some libraries chose to boycott publishers. Uh, Boulder Public Library did not participate in any boycotts, nor did my last library, although my last library considered suing Amazon. And I was like, are we crazy? Like, <laughs> that's not going to go anywhere. But, um, you know, it's one of these things where it is an extraordinary cost, but, you know, at the time when it happened, um, ebooks made up about one or two percent of the overall market for books. Over the course of one year, it jumped to 22 percent. So I knew, as a public library director, I knew that the consumers, that, that, that their appetite was for ebooks, and that, that we, it could feasibly make up 22 percent of our circulation. As I said, last year it made up over 30. But at that time, it was extremely costly to build a collection. At this point, Boulder Public Library has invested heavily in ebooks. We were able to meet the market. And I'm happy to say, or, you know, I think most readers, and I know I am, I mean, actually, I've moved away from reading on screens almost as much as I can because I don't appreciate that experience. Um, but that's the same conclusion that a lot of people made. They're mostly pretty ecumenical, right? If you're traveling, you may load five books on an ebook and take them with you. But if you're at home in bed, you're probably going to read a physical book. So it really, from that 22%, it kind of grew to 25% by 2018, 2019. At that point, the percentage of ebook sales began to decline. And so now it is leveled out roughly at around 22%. It probably increased again during the pandemic. I haven't seen the numbers from the pandemic. But right around 2020, it was making up about 22% of sales of of popular, of, of consumer reading in, in the United States. And so that's a reasonable market. We've kind of built a collection at this point. Um, it's costly when we have a waiting list because the library has rules around waiting lists. If like there's more than five people waiting for an item, we buy it again. And so that's, you can imagine that's painful when the cost of the book is 80 or $100. It's quite painful when we think like, oh gosh, we're gonna buy another one for 80 or $100 in order to manage that ebook waiting list. But um, it's kind of worked out, you know, 26 circs is not an unfair number um, in the overall cost of things. If you look at the economy of physical books, they take up a lot of space. When you check out an e-book, uh, check out a physical book from the library, you probably go get it yourself and do self-checks. But when it comes back, I have staff people who have to handle that book. They have to put it on a cart. They take the cart. So there's a lot of costs associated with physical books, which a lot of people don't really think about in terms of how a library runs. And with ebooks, we don't have that. So that, that, that factors into how we evaluate the cost of ebooks. And so long as we're getting numbers and meeting the community need for those materials, I'm happy to do it at this point, even though I feel like they've been punishing us. David, <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much for your leadership of creating a gathering place of knowledge for the people of Boulder. We very much appreciate what you have done for us. Yes. And in your honor, the Boulder Rotary Club is pleased to contribute 100 doses of polio vaccine to the Polio Plus Fund. Uh, thank thank you. you very much. Thank you all very much for having me. I will stick around after the event if anybody has other questions that they'd like to talk about. So thank you all very much for having me today.